In order for that to take place, farmers have to have better price incentives. These, these very low prices have to go away. Subsidies have to be eliminated. And secondly, governments in developing countries have to start investing. Les plantes génétiquement modifiées, c'est un outil parmi d'autres. Ça peut servir à faire, euh, par exemple, imaginer qu'on ait un problème du type du phylloxéra sur la vigne euh, en début du XXe siècle. Ça pourrait permettre d'avoir une obtention rapide. Donc moi, je crois qu'il ne faut pas fermer la porte aux OGM. Mais inversement, vous ne m'entendrez jamais dire que les OGM, c'est la solution à la fin dans le monde. Quel OGM Pourquoi faire Par qui Et à quel prix GMO is one of these modish, fashionable things for latte liberals to get upset about. But uh, think of it this way. It's just a matter of producing better seeds that are resistant to more of the ills that farming is heir to. So you build in resistance uh, to pests. Otherwise, you have to use pesticides. And if you use pesticides, they get into the aquifers and into the streams. Whereas if they're built into the seeds, you don't need the pesticides. Here at home and in foreign lands, I demonstrate my know-how to farmers from other countries. In this time of scientific revolution, let it never be said that we were able to send men into space, but unable to send bread and milk to hungry people on this earth. Alors évidemment, les promoteurs des OGM essayent de faire croire que l'Union européenne est complètement isolée dans sa résistance aux OGM, mais c'est l'inverse. Dans le monde, il y a 25 pays qui cultivent des OGM sur près de 200 pays. Donc aujourd'hui, il faut quand même garder la tête froide. Les OGM augmentent chaque année et ils augmentent principalement, et on le verra, c'est intéressant, dans les pays où l'opinion publique n'est pas au courant, c'est-à-dire où il n'y a pas de règlement sur l'étiquetage, où il n'y a pas de résistance des consommateurs aux OGM, on les a maintenus dans l'ignorance. Nous avons à réfléchir à l'avance à une agriculture adaptée à un changement climatique. Donc nous réfléchissons non seulement à une agriculture qui produit plus autre chose et autrement, mais une agriculture qui doit anticiper des conditions euh, physiques, naturelles, écologiques différentes. And the insidious, creeping, and in the long run, perhaps the most destructive force of all, the thing called pollution. Ce que je demande au comité consultatif du Conseil des droits de l'homme, dont je suis membre, c'est de déclarer un moratoire, une interdiction radicale, au moins pendant cinq ans, sur la transformation de la nourriture, blé, riz, mille, etc., en bioéthanol ou en biodiesel. Based on some of the policies that we've got, uh, we're going to see continued increases in the production of uh, grain-based biofuels, both in the U.S. and uh, probably to a lesser extent in the EU. Uh, but hopefully, we're going to begin soon to see a transition to second-generation biofuels. And by that, I mean biofuels that are not using grains or other food type of feedstocks as their feedstocks, but are using typically a lignocellulose or raw biomass as the feedstock. So this could be plants, it could be trees, it could be waste biomass. If I grow an acre of corn, and I'm looking at it from the standpoint of producing oil, uh, I can grow about 18 gallons of oil per acre per year. So now I'll move up, let's go up to the, the next highest, or, or what's the most prevalent, is palm. Palm, we get seven to 800 gallons per acre per year. Algae, I can go up to 20,000 gallons of oil per acre per year. And algae is the fastest organism, fastest growing plant on the planet, and it sequesters the greatest amount of carbon dioxide. But at the same time, it produces lipids, basically vegetable oil. If we took one-tenth of the state of New Mexico and converted it into algae production, we could meet all of the energy demands for the entire United States. But there's an interesting thing here. By 2015, these current European and North American biofuel policies will only have reduced greenhouse gas emissions from transport fuel by 0.8%. On the other hand, Brazilian ethanol from sugarcane has already been proved to reduce emissions by at least 80%.
Currently, the USA places a prohibitively high tax on cane ethanol and subsidizes its own inefficient corn ethanol. With money, there would be better use building up wind or solar capacity and, and finding new sources of potable water. Because without water, growing food is just not as much fun. Farmers themselves are now realizing that water has to be conserved. So there is an attempt to move to new crop cycles which may require little less water. Nevertheless, when you get something like the current food crisis and the price of rice shoots up, rice needs 22 irrigations against seven irrigations per week. It is the most water-intensive crop of all. So if the price of that is high and the price of electricity is zero, everybody is going to pump more water. And just drawing up water at heavy rates from aquifers you go to the American Midwest and you check out the Ogallala Aquifer, find out that what had been sustaining the entire Midwest in terms of our agriculture there, the fields of Nebraska and Iowa, it's running dry. And when that aquifer runs out, there's simply no way that we can even grow food any longer in the Midwest. The Midwest will become an arid, desert-like area. You know, when the flour is milled, all the nutrients are taken away. So what we do is we put the nutrients back in. Through our programs, we actually try to reduce vitamin and mineral deficiencies through fortification. We um, try to stimulate uh, the countries to continue with our food fortification programs. We work for and with the poorest people living in the poorest countries. The goal this year is to try to help about 90 million people. That's more or less 10%, only 10% of the people who are, who are hungry in this world. But it's also at the same time an enormous amount. If food is available on local markets, but the consumer cannot purchase the food, then injecting more food on that market would be a further disruption to the producer and would only solve the consumer's problem temporarily and a better response maybe in the form of the provision of cash or vouchers to purchase the existing food. No, all very well and good in the short term, but giving alms is not the same as effecting a cure. Right now in Thailand, the, the buzzword is a sufficiency economy. We and total control over one's food supply is simply impossible. Because we're in a volatile world market. Who knows what prices will be? Who knows what markets will be? We stand right now on the brink of an economic collapse of the United States. Most of the world has been told, gear your markets towards exporting to the United States. Well, what happens if the US can't buy anymore? So I think we're, we're in a very interesting moment of enormous debate over what kind of food system we should have. And more and more people are going back to what sounds like a very old fashioned notion not only should countries grow the needs of their own people, but even on a smaller scale, provinces and communities should grow more and more of what their people need. And they should do it in a way that, that is cognizant of the fact that we live in a world where there is going to be less water per person, less fresh, clean water per person, less petroleum per person, and therefore it needs to be a different kind of agriculture. When investors receive fair dividends, they are eager to supply industry with a steady flow of capital to create new tools and plants, which in turn create new jobs. With business prosperous and employment high, the farmer has a ready and profitable market for the sale of his produce. This is a hundred billion dollars. It won't buy you bread. Zimbabwe. The great granary of Africa. From success to starvation, no getting off in between. Be it in Ireland or the Veldt, this situation recurs, and it shall recur. Have I not yet made my point? C'est arrivé dans l'histoire au XIVe siècle. La banqueroute des banques Lombarde et de Venise à l'époque et Cette banqueroute a été due au fait qu'il n'y euh, avait pas de taux d'intérêt à l'époque, mais on saisissait les biens. Le roi d'Angleterre a dit « Laissez-moi tranquille, je ne veux pas ». Et à ce moment-là, tout le système s'est effondré. Et ce qui est arrivé dans l'effondrement de ce système, 
c'est que simplement, il y avait des pouvoirs en place qui étaient des pouvoirs un peu comme ceux d'aujourd'hui, qui étaient des pouvoirs qui avaient des instruments de répression, qui avaient des instruments d'ordre social, mais pas de développement économique, pas de croissance. Et lorsque est venue de l'extérieur une menace, et ça a été la peste, venue euh, d'Asie mineure, quand est revenue cette peste, il n'y a pas eu d'institution, il n'y a pas eu d'infrastructure, il n'y a pas eu de moyens humains qui soient capables de résister, parce qu'on ne pensait pas long, on ne pensait pas à long terme. Et la moitié de l'Europe a été détruite. Having been in Asia uh, during the economic crisis, we have seen that nutritious food and the more expensive food was immediately sacrificed. So that means that uh, the poorer segments of the population will go back to an unsatisfying diet. Ultimately, this will result in nutrition and health problems. We need to produce more, and the, the global financial crisis we're going through is making things worse because what it's doing is uh, cutting off cash flows to uh, the agricultural sector, which includes the logistics people, the fertilizer companies, capital expenditures that would have gone to, to build new fertilizer plants. They're not being done. So in that sense, we've cut off some of the lifeblood of the solutions to the food challenge. What we're seeing now is because of the lack of financing resulting from this credit crisis is that the farmers are planting less and there are real shortages of capital in many regions. In Brazil, in the last period, there was a reported nearly $10 billion uh, shortfall of capital. The farmers are really suffering. It depends region to region, but I would say that we really, the industry really does need state support to see it through this, this really critical period. Low-lying wetland and fields full of rocks. They have some cows, but no need for the right kind of feed. As a result, the cows cannot produce as well as they should, and the farmer's income drops still lower. We have come to the end of the era of market fundamentalism, and this recent global economic crisis, financial crisis, has reminded everybody that markets can't solve most problems, and that we need good government intervention, good government incentives for social goals, to make sure that the poor are not left behind. And I believe that addressing the, the global food crisis as a massive violation of the human right to adequate food brings into the debate this dimension of governance, of accountability, which for the moment has been completely absent from the answers of the international community. If we have some weather problem which cuts back food production, and we've been so lucky for so long, we're overdue for it, what that means is we will have a full-blown global food crisis then because we didn't have an orderly buildup of the capital capacity because of the uh, financial crisis. L'histoire de l'humanité, toute l'histoire de la Terre, est une histoire de variation de température. C'est la ressource humaine qui a fait que nous ayons pu vivre euh, ici en France dans des froids sibériens, on a des températures tropicales sur le cycle de 100 000 ans. Donc c'est l'être humain, c'est cet être humain qui est une ressource inépuisable, et c'est ça que je pas voir Malthus. Il applique une théorie de l'animal à l'être humain. I see hope when um, I go out and I talk to people who get really excited about having a cause and having a purpose. We can be the generation that is solving all these problems. We're not anywhere near the limits at this moment. That's nonsense. We're not in that sort of crisis. Humanity is not coming to an end. It's not the end of the world. And no, you're not, you don't have to go on a diet tomorrow. But it is clear that, the, that our systems, which have accelerating consumption, can't be sustained. Not by agriculture, not by the earth. Oh, thank you. Mm. <coughs> I just spoke with the producer. And? He just spoke with management. They want to cut all our segments from the documentary. Apparently, they don't find you endearing enough. What well, blasted all? What was the point of even doing the ruddy interview then? What? Well, nice to get out and about for a bit, eh? Rather. Hmm. And I think we have just enough time for supper before we're expected back. Ah. I'm buying. You, young lady, uh, call us a carriage. Bath Abbey, St. Nicholas Cemetery, Hoodenhoos, via a good restaurant. Steak and kidney pudding? No fear, Portuguese. Uh, if you must. 
So, I'm not endearing, am I? Not really, no. Good. Rather be right than liked, ruddy ostriches.